So BlackRock just filed to have $150 billion worth of U.S. Treasuries tokenized onto Ethereum. We got some news that Chick-fil-A will actually be accepting stablecoins now. And Visa, who's also building on Ethereum, is launching uh, stablecoin payment rails in South America. So let's go ahead and dive in. So the first article here, uh, BlackRock just filed to tokenize shares of its $150 billion treasury fund on Ethereum. Now, the article doesn't explicitly say Ethereum, but there are there is evidence that it's just it's very obvious that it is Ethereum, and we're going to go over that. So uh, BlackRock filed a prospectus to create digital shares of its $150 billion treasury fund. The DLT shares will be available only via BNY Mellon. And for those of y'all that, if you don't know, BNY Mellon, that's Bank of New York Mellon, they aren't uh, typically, they're not like a regular bank like Chase where you go in, you open a, a checking account. They're a custodia bank, so they typically deal with high net worth individuals. They deal with... Uh, you know, institutions like BlackRock or governments and whatnot. So BlackRock CEO Larry Fink has previously highlighted that tokenization will revolutionize investing. And this goes back to a lot of things that they've said. They have publicly stated that Ethereum is the default choice for stablecoin adoption, DeFi, and tokenization. So they've also been leading the charge as far as getting crypto to be adopted within uh, in the, within America and really around the world because they see this as a, a revolutionary type of technology. And if we come back to my post here, there is this image uh, from a from another article, and it says that BNY will broadcast select funding account data to the Ethereum network. And then at the bottom here, I have highlighted that. It, BlackRock will be the first client to leverage uh, this product. BNY will broadcast the funding account, yada, yada. So, you know, basically, it's very obvious that this fund is going to be on Ethereum just based on their public statements and then this other article that's talking about it. So, you know, this is really exciting. You know, BlackRock leads the way in uh, crypto innovation. And, and you know, they were the, one of the first ones, if not the first, to file for the, the Bitcoin spot ETFs. And so now they're leading the charge with, hey, we're, yeah, we're serious about tokenizing all of the world's assets. And, you know, the, the stocks and bonds in America and stable coins, you're talking $120 trillion worth of assets plus, and I haven't done the exact calculation. I know it's it's right around $120 trillion, uh, But, you know, it's just, it's absolutely incredible. And if we come over here, we can take a look at, so there is uh, currently for tokenized treasuries, and that's what this fund is, there's currently $6 billion worth of tokenized treasuries and four and a half billion of that is on Ethereum. So, you know, I mean, it, I'm just trying to show how how big of a deal this is, how how much this six billion is about to increase. So moving on to the Chick Fil A news. So this is kind of interesting. So Chick Fil A and USDC. So you can now order from any of the three thousand two hundred locations of Chick Fil A across the U.S. Uh, using USDC on base to uh, get delivered to your door. So that's exciting. And I think we're going to start seeing more and more of this as stable coins are adopted. And, you know, like David Sachs has said, they want trillions of stable coins. Well, you need to do something with those stable coins. And so we're going to see a lot more retailers accepting stable coins as a form of payment over debit cards and, and credit cards and whatnot. So now I, I kind of want to go over this Ethereum definition crisis is kind of what I'm calling it. There's a whole lot of fighting going on on, on crypto Twitter about people saying, you know, layer twos aren't Ethereum, this isn't Ethereum, that this is Ethereum. And so I, I to me, it just comes down to definitions. You know, you have ETH, T, ETH, that's the ticker. That is the digital store of value. It's You can think of it like Bitcoin, except it has a digital economy and tokenized assets and everything built on top of it. And then you have the Ethereum layer one. And I think, you know, this is where a lot of the argument comes from because people say, well, uh, Ethereum uh, layer twos, they aren't Ethereum. What they're really saying is that layer twos are not the layer one, because at least this is how I interpret it. Uh, so the the Ethereum layer one, decentralized settlement and security layer, Ethereum layer two, scalable execution layers. These are going to be like uh, a customized private uh, or semi-private. Uh, and what, what I mean by private is like it, it, it's private in the sense that like like Coinbase, they're a private company that launched a layer two for scaling and, and they're building it out and growing the Ethereum ecosystem. Uh, and then you have uh, Ethereum as a whole. So whenever people talk about Ethereum, I think of it like somebody saying the internet. If you think of the internet, you think of Google, you think of YouTube, Amazon, uh, Netflix, you think of everything inside the, Ether uh, the uh, internet's ecosystem. Whenever I hear Ethereum, I think of Ethereum as a whole. I think of the layer one. I think of the layer two. I think of the asset. I think of all the dApps and everything that's built out on 
the ecosystem. And I, I just kind of feel like it, it's really this simple. You know, if, if you're going to talk technicals, like maybe there's a layer two that is not as aligned with the layer one that you want it to be, I think we need to be very specific and say, just from a marketing perspective, you know, the layer two, this layer two here needs to be more aligned with the layer one for whatever reason, technical detail wise, maybe they're avoiding fees or, or they're doing something, right? But that doesn't mean they're in a part of Ethereum, the ecosystem. If they exist on the L1, which all the layer twos and everything does, right? Because if they didn't, then they wouldn't be in a layer. L Ethereum, they wouldn't be called an Ethereum layer two. The, the Ethereum ecosystem as a whole is what matters because as the Ethereum ecosystem as a whole grows, that grows value to the uh, ETH, the store of value asset, because it is, it's the digital representation of this entire economy. You know, it, it, it secures the, uh, the entire economy that is built on top of it. And so as time goes on, as we see companies like BlackRock building, you know, 150 billion, and it's going to go into the trillions and trillions upon trillions of, of uh, dollars worth of assets on chain, we're going to see a lot of these TradFi programs, like Thinkorswim, for example, it's a trading program that's very popular, that's going to end up getting converted into a DeFi type of trading platform in the future. Uh, and all these TradFi systems are eventually just going to be converted into DeFi ecosystems. So, you know, whenever we talk about Ethereum, I think it's very, very important to think of Ethereum as a whole, because it's all encompassing because everything is built on top of it, just like the internet, you think of the internet, you think of everything. So moving on to the uh, the GDP data. So US GDP came in negative. Uh, but he, so here's what basically really happened. You have uh, the largest decline in GDP here is coming in from 4.8%. And that's from imports. So basically what happened was a lot of these companies said, oh crap, Trump's tariffs are about to make everything very expensive for us to import. Let's import a ton of product so that we have, you know, this kind of buffer where we can still make a lot of profit on, on these products before things get more expensive. And so what that does is imports are subtracted from our GDP and then exports count, count towards it growing. So because companies wanted to buy a ton of products, it looks like our, the GDP goes down and maybe we're going into a recession, but not really, because in my mind, like, okay, the tariffs are already out there, right? They're already in place. So it's not a case like, you know, in, in Q2, it's not like the companies can go out there and buy a ton of products in advance in order to uh, kind of buffer themselves from this, this massive uh, cost increase that they, they might see. So I think this is kind of a limited thing within Q1 where we had this temporary decline. Uh, and then the other part was uh, we saw a quarter... Uh, basically 25 basis point decrease from government spending cuts. So basically, you know, we've been hearing about this with Doge, they're cutting back on spending, making, uh, you know, wasteful spending or whatever is going on there. Basically, they're cutting government spending and that contributes to uh, the GDP going down as well. So again, I think I don't think this is I think it's a little early to assume that this is uh, inflation. I think this is this is or excuse me, not inflation. I think it's a little early to assume that this is uh, us going into a recession. Uh, I think this is just a temporary blip. So moving on. So uh, Visa uh, has launched out in uh, South America. So they're going to be doing uh, stable coins linked cards down in South America. And this is really interesting. And I've talked about this before, how the reason that Ethereum is attracting so many stable coins to it is obviously security and settlement. It's the most secure decentralized network out there, but also because of the economy that's being built on top of it. You have to have an economy, you have to have products and, and places for people to spend, like going back to uh, the Chick-fil-A thing. You know, what good is a stable coin if I can't go to Chick-fil-A and buy a, a chicken sandwich for lunch? So coming over here, uh, the CEO of Bridge uh, has the same conclusion. He says for consumers to use stable coins at large scale, uh, they'll have to be interoperable with existing tools and services that customers and businesses are accustomed to. And so think about that for a second. Like, let's say you have somebody in South America and they want to travel to some other part of the world. Well, in order for stable coins to actually function the way that they need to is that these stable coins need to be interoperable, but they also need to be interchangeable. Like the whole world has to adopt them. You know, if you're in South America, you can't come to the United States and not be able to spend stable coins. Or if you're in the United States, you know, go to another country and not be able to spend uh, your stable coins there. So, you know, this is just 
a massive adoption push all over the world for stable coins. And I think that a lot of people are underestimating how big it's going to get and how quickly it's going to get. So I think that pretty much wraps up today's video. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment section down below. And until next time, I'll see y'all then.